Okay, our, our next presenter is uh, Andrew Smith Lewis. He's CEO and co founder of Sorego. And uh, for the Virginians in the room, he's, uh, he's all about Wahoo Wah. He's a UVA grad. Uh, so I know that means uh, something to some of the who's that are hanging out here. And, uh, sir? I mean, I'm crushing over his Alexa. He has the new Alexa up here. I have the old one, so. Thank you. How y'all doing? <laughs> well, according to my Apple Watch, my pulse is 128, which is a little bit high for me. I'm very excited and nervous. I'm partially nervous because of this gentleman here in the orange jacket, who I've been trying to meet for 15 years and he's been avoiding me somehow. And it took the US Army to bring us together. So I'm very excited to get to make this presentation. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm a New Yorker as well. I'm gonna fly fast and low, so I will run you through something and then we'll hopefully have a chance to ask some questions. Um, you know the conference we're at. My topic is smart spaces and smart people. I'm gonna focus on the smart people. How many of you would like to be smarter? All right. How many of you think it's possible to become smarter? Almost the same number. That's awesome. Good stuff. So let's excite the possibilities and consider what would it take, we'll put 2050 aside for now as Elliot suggested, but what would it take to make us smarter right now? So first, let's talk about where we are, where education is today. I believe education has a last mile problem, and I will tell you what I mean by that. I think partially this comes about because the focus of education is primarily on content and classrooms. And for classrooms, you can substitute in whatever you want, field of operations. And this hasn't changed since Socrates started teaching under trees about 2,500 years ago. The content is the what, the material, that's obviously very important. The classrooms are where learning happens. But how about how we learn? How is the how considered? So we obviously have made progress. We all know this. Everybody in the room has done online courses. And computers are awesome. But computers have introduced a whole host of other problems, one of which is PICN. Now, I know the Army loves acronyms. So what is PICN? No one? Presentation-induced cerebral necrosis, <laughs> known as death by PowerPoint. <laughs> And this is not something unique to the men in green. There are organizations throughout the world that believe that somehow by rendering something into a PowerPoint, it takes on some magical properties to be able to, to transmit knowledge. And we know that this just isn't true. Now, there have been other great innovations. Um, some of my favorites are innovations around the delivery of content, from the PDF to digital books to all sorts of wonderful online properties that we use, things like the Kindle, which is fantastic. The fact that we can now experience a great lecture without having to be physically present, from the Khan Academy to TED Talks, which we all have watched. Um, amazing work in the reduction in the cost of education. So we know that the cost of education is rising precipitously. Great work from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, open educational resources, resources, partnerships between groups like edX and ASU. Phenomenal. But when you think about it and step back, that stuff is still the what. The stuff on the right is kind of where, but the how is being ignored. And the how is the last mile of the brain. The how is from whatever the thing that is delivering content is to your brain. That last mile is a major delivery problem. And that's really the focus of what I'm passionate about. Any doctors in the room? Medical doctors in the room? OK, doctor, a question for you. Um, if I have a condition, if I'm diagnosed with a condition, the medication that's prescribed to me, is it important what that medication is? Yes. OK, so we confirm that. The what is very important. How about how I take that medication? Does that matter? Absolutely. It does? And is it important to give people really strong advice about how to take that medication? Yes. OK. So think about education. Think about what happens. We're really passionate about the what, right? We put this stuff into people's hands. But we kind of leave it up to them to get it in their heads. Right? It's kind of like I go to a doctor, and the doctor says, Andrew, you're sick. Here's your medication. And I say, well, how, how, do, how do I take this? And they say, come back in two weeks. You're a grown man. You've taken medication your whole life. Just come back. You'll be fine. Come back two weeks later if I'm still alive, and I'm no better. And the doc looks at me and says, what the hell happened? You didn't do this right. Go do it again. 
And sort of semi-facetiously, that's what happens in education. Think about how many of you are familiar with a training support package. Some of you have heard of the training support packages. Do you know what those are? When you get a piece of equipment, it comes with directions. Very important. How important is it to understand how to use a piece of equipment in the military? If you have a Harris radio, is it important to understand how to use that radio? Right? Does that training and support package magically convey that information into the heads of the learner? That's the challenge. So, my question is, can we radically improve how we learn and scale it? That's what my company is about. So I'm Andrew Smith-Lewis, co-founder and CEO of Cerego. I'm very passionate about keeping people ahead of machines. Our mission at Cerego is to improve how the world learns. We've built a single generalizable platform for acquiring and demonstrating knowledge and capability. A little bit of a mouthful. Generalizable means one platform, infinite possibilities. From aviation, astronomy, music medicine to zombies and zoology, we cover everything for our clients. And it's one stack. It's actually a couple stacks because we run secure AWS GovCloud stacks. And then we have a public stack, but it's one platform with infinite possibilities. We're very passionate about this idea of helping people acquire, get stuff into their heads, which is super important. But what's really important is what they do with it. And what would also be super important is to be able to measure their knowledge and their underlying cognitive and behavioral attributes. And I'll talk about that. And essentially, what we want to do is getting back to making people smarter, which I think is a righteous cause. OK. So who uses this technology that you've never heard of? Well, we have half of our business is uh, academic and half is non-academic. On the academic side, we work in K-12 with grip, uh, groups like McGraw-Hill, who's got 50,000 students using Cerego. The KIPP public charter schools use Cerego. GEMS, the largest uh, education institution you've never heard of, with 250,000 students around the Middle East and Africa, is powered by Cerego. Higher ed, we work with great folks like uh, Arizona State University, New York University, Elsevier, the publisher, Cengage, the publisher. Africa Leadership University uses Cerego for its admissions um, in, uh, on the continent, places like the University of Southern Denmark. Corporate side, we work with a little group called Target that uses Cerego. Um, we work with a group called Salient that does financial services. We work with Guardian Health that's leading um, the charge on liquid biopsies, which are incredible. On the government side, we work with the US Army. Who else? Um, and we also work directly with the Army, which I'll talk about. And then we work with some uh, defense contractors that are using us. In fact, today, we've got three groups at three different installations learning how to use some very, very advanced equipment powered by Cerego, which I'm very proud of. In total, we've had about 500 partners um, and about 5 million learners to date. We've been heavily backed, um, although we are for profit, we've been heavily backed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that paved the way with multi million dollar grants for about 200 community colleges around the country to use Cerego. We work with a little startup medical school called Harvard out of Boston that uses Cerego. The Mayo Clinic uses Cerego, UNICEF, just kind of anybody. So we are very agnostic to the what and the where. We're all about the how. So this concept of keeping people ahead of machines, I wanted to talk about this a little bit because there's been a lot of talk about AI this morning, and obviously this is an important topic. Um, there are people out there, and some of you in this room might believe that AI is becoming a little bit too powerful, that AI will give rise to a super intelligence, that that super intelligence will give rise to an army of robots. Those robots will enslave the planet, and they will lead to an extinction event. So you kind of giggle a little bit, but there's some pretty smart people who are saying that this is a possibility and we have to be careful here. And so we have to stay ahead of the machines. I don't believe that's exactly the way this goes out. I think that, um, and this is an image that I've been using for a while. I think it's the same image that's on the Mad Scientist uh, homepage. I think it's about a partnership and collaboration. And what I mean by keeping people ahead of machines is, for me, it's about the emphasis on priority. Companies like IBM Watson are convincing the world that they can use AI to make smarter machines to do the work of men and women. I believe that the goal of our company is really about using AI to make smarter people. And I think that's what's important. So we'll leave the machines to somebody else, but I want to keep the focus on the people. So how do we pull this off? So first, let's step back and look at modern education. Modern education predominantly has a phenomenal one-size-fits-all model of instruction where we have uh, been doing this for a very, very long time. 
We had this wonderful loop of uh, lectures and homework, which is a vicious cycle that leads to testing, and then the blame game starts, right? We give people grades, right? And the, and the instrument of testing is a very blunt instrument. We give people a one-stop snap, snapshot in time. We take their pulse and we prescribe medication for them. That's a pretty bad and um, unfortunate way of uh, educating people. And what it leads to is gaps in knowledge. And this is a huge problem. And I think, really, if you step back and think about this even further, the problem is that education has been about constraining the time to learn. That's the thing. You've got X number of hours to get through this program, and that's it. And when you constrain time, you end up with variable outcomes. But what if you flip this whole thing around? And what if instead what you focused on was this concept of varying the time to learn and you went for one fixed outcome for everybody, which was basically success? And in the process of getting that, what you really were able to do is help learners develop a positive mindset of grit, perseverance, and agency. That'd be a good thing. Would we agree? Yes. The challenge is kind of how do you get there and what does it take? So how do you design and implement a system like that? So how do you go from basically having no idea what's in people's heads to having a very clear understanding on an individual by individual basis of what they know? So I think that the approach is basically using some AI, some narrow AI. I'm not talking super generalized AI. I'm talking narrow AI powered by brain science. And I think it has a couple characteristics. One is you have to be able to actually measure knowledge and capability. You've got to be able to predict performance. And you have to be able to accelerate learning. And I'd like to talk you through those steps. So brain science. What do I mean by brain science? A lot of people talk about brain science. I would like to refer to these two old, dead, white men. Does anybody know who these people are? Ebbinghaus. Ebbinghaus and Bloom. Bloom. OK, Ebbinghaus and Bloom. So the grandfathers, the great grandfathers of a lot of the great work that's been done. Ebbinghaus is famous for the forgetting curve, or if you're an optimist, the learning curve that says, hey, when information, when we forget something in air quotes, it doesn't simply disappear into the ether. It descends along a predictable function. And by understanding that function and characterizing that function, we can use that information to counteract memory decay and promote long-term retention. Does kind of make sense? OK. And Bloom, what is Bloom famous for? Bloom's taxonomy, you're a great group. What else is Bloom famous for? Two, anyone, anyone? Are you Googling this, Elliot? OK. Yeah, two sigma. All right, so let's talk two sigma. So two sigma is some really interesting research, controversial research, that Bloom did in the 80s. And basically, he took. Um, a couple hundred kids, and he split them into three groups. He had a control group, kind of business as usual in the middle. He put uh, one third of them through what he called mastery training. Bloom's mastery training, bless you, was a protocol that was developed whereby he would give them a test, review exactly what they got wrong on that test, give them the same test again, rinse and repeat this until those students got a 90% on that exam. And they would generally hold one sigma or one standard deviation above the mean. Now, one standard deviation change in education is ginormous. If you can get anywhere near one sigma, you are a rock star in education. So this was a big deal. But Bloom found that when he added personal tutoring to this, when he gave them uh, a personal instructor, a tutor, he got a two sigma bump, which is crazy big. And this has been known as the two sigma problem, because how do you scale private tutoring to everybody on the planet, right? Interesting side note, homeschooling kids, right? Statistically, a homeschooling mom or dad with no educational background or degree, that kid will beat the pants off any kid in the best private school. Why? Because that mom or dad is personalizing the instruction. They don't have to be an expert in chemistry to figure out how to help their kid advance chemistry. So my company is about taking great applied research. We haven't cooked this stuff up. I don't have a lab with a bunch of people probing brains yet. I'd like to do that someday. Um, but we basically are standing on the shoulders of giants like these two gentlemen. And I believe that what we can do is use modern techniques. Machine learning can translate this type of research into programs that can scale to anyone, anywhere. And by doing that, we get closer to true personalization of learning. Kind of make sense? 
The devil is always in the details. So let's not go too far into the weeds, but let's talk a little bit of details. How do you do this, right? How do you start to figure this out? Well, first you need big data, right? Well, I don't think it's big data. I think it's the right data, but we'll talk about that in a minute. You need data, right? And with that data, you need to build a model, right? You have to have a model for understanding how things work. And then you make predictions based on your model. This is the way it works. You then use machine learning to error correct and fix your predictions. So all of this we do in the, in the lens of cognitive science. And so what cognitive science helps us do is define what's the right data. People love talking about big data. It's not big data, it's the right data. You have to be able to find, very often it's small data that's going to work for you. That small data will help you define the right model. What do we need to know about learning and forgetting and long-term retention and performance that informs the model? And lastly, we need to be able to interpret predictions. So the data comes in, we interpret those predictions, and we change our model. Okay, so for the scientists in the room, very, very high level superficial. For some of your others, I see your eyes rolling back in your head. So let me move forward. That's what my company is about. My, my company, our research, is about leveraging big data, cognitive science, and machine learning to improve how people learn. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I think this is the golden moment. So I bet all of you in this room would agree that the combination of inter the internet and learning science can have a massive disruptive effect on educational outcomes. And we're in this golden moment where we have smart devices. We have devices like Alexa, we have smartphones. We're all walking around with a microcomputer in our pocket hooked to the internet 24 seven. It's an incredible affordance for learning. And let me talk to you really, really high level about some of the science that we use and how we put this into action. How many of you are familiar with DARPA? Okay, um, our DARPA is the Distributed uh, Adaptive Retrieval Practice Algorithm. So we have coined our own DARPA. Um, it, we're not as big as the DARPA yet, but we're closing on them very quickly. So Distributed Adaptive Retrieval Practice, what does this mean? This is taking advantage of two of the most well-researched phenomena for learning. One is the concept of distributed learning, which says if long-term retention is your goal, if you want behavior modification at the end of the day, you have to spread out the information over time. Retrieval practice says that when you re-engage with the information, you do it in such a way that you stimulate that neural net. You get some changes in the brain that people hang on to, okay? So distributed learning, what's the opposite of distributed learning? Hmm? Yeah, they're sort of the purveyors of the opposite, but there's a four-letter word. I know none of you have ever done this. What's the opposite? Begins with a C. Cramming, okay, so none of you, you probably don't know what cramming is because none of you scream cramming. Cramming is an ancient practice for partying an entire semester, <laughs> staying up the night before in caffeine, no dose, whatever, pick your poison, trying to get as much stuff into your head so that you can regurgitate it on an exam only to forget it all a week later. That's cramming. Retrieval practice means that when you you interact with information, you do it in such a way there's a little bit of desirable difficulty, there's something that challenges you to think. The opposite of retrieval practice is a little more subtle, but we do it every day. It's reading, <coughs> reading, or watching. We love to read, we love to watch, we consume media like it's going out of style, and they just keep making more of it. And what happens is when you read something, I'm gonna keep picking on Elliot, when Elliot reads something, part of Elliot's brain asks the other part, do I know this information? And the, uh, part of his brain says, of course you know this information. And so Elliot moves on. And then two hours later, he can't remember what he read. And we all suffer from this, right? This is a little bit of a cognitive illusion that goes on in our minds. So the point is that while these things are counterintuitive, they're highly effective. Our machine learning algorithm can measure what you know, what you don't know, and create this optimal schedule to get you to the goal line, personalized for you. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah? Okay. On the, anybody know what metacognition is? Easing metacognitive burden. Of course you know. What's metacognition? Thinking about how we think. Yes, thinking about your own thinking. We are homo sapiens sapiens, which means we can think about our own thinking, and apparently that separates us from all the other life on the planet. So what that means practically in a learning environment is when someone sits down to a task at hand, part of their cognitive workload is on the task at hand. I've got to learn astronomy. But a lot of their workload goes to the housekeeping around that. Starts to think about, well, how much time should I spend on this topic now? Where am I strong? Where am I weak? When do I move on? What's for lunch? When am 
I getting deployed? All that stuff goes on, which takes away from the task at hand. Does that kind of make sense? So we just have a better mousetrap. When you come to Serigo, it says, hey, Colonel, welcome back. Here's your new content, here's your review content, and off you go. You've got no cognitive load associated with trying to figure out where you are. And because of that, you can get in and out of Serigo very fast. We have 75,000 nurses a year using Serigo to learn very, very advanced content, predominantly on this device. And they can get in and out in 10 minutes, where most people can't even open a textbook and reorient themselves in 10 minutes. And by the way, the only thing that we found that's twice as effective clinically to Serigo is Serigo on this mobile device. Why would this be twice as effective? Access. Access, right? Access, and we're obsessed with these things, right? We check our mobile phone 75 times a day. If you have a little notification saying, hey, now's a good time to jump back into your TC3 training, you're more likely to comply. And little and often is the magic recipe for that sort of compliance, right? Back to the doctor. Doctor, when we take medication, when we take medication, how do we know how to take the medication? We give instructions. And are those instructions completely personalized to the physiology of the individual? Not generally. It's kind of a one-size-fits-all model, but it's better than nothing, right? It's better than take the medication, see in two weeks, see if you survive, right? The Serigo, when you take the drug with Serigo, your cell phone goes off and says, hey, tomorrow, take half the dose before lunch. And then it instruments, the data goes back to the doctor. And then the next day it says, you can skip today's dose. And it's completely personalized to the individual. So that's what, that's what I mean by personalization, and that's how I think it, it relates to learning. So blasting forward. The other thing which would be cool is this idea of, of quantifying knowledge and capability. How many of you have a Fitbit, Apple Watch, some sort of tracking device, right? So we're, we're kind of obsessed with this idea of tracking our physical movements through space and time, which is super cool. What if you could do that for stuff in your head? What if you knew? What if you could go back? Think about the, the millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of educational value trapped in this room. Do we remember all that content? Do we remember what's relevant for us? What if you had access to that? That's kind of our vision. So we have this data-driven model that surfaces not only what people know, but how they learn. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. Um, one of my favorite things to do is power MOOCs. Are you familiar with like MOOCs like edX? So we were one of the first integrated partners into edX. We power half the universities on edX. Use Serigo directly embedded in from Harvard to MIT to ASU. Um, it's a great environment for us. So that's a very classic e example of working with industries and with working with academics. But then let's talk about the U.S. Army. So we've done a couple of interesting pilots with the U.S. Army. The first was at USARPAC in Hawaii where they worked on things like like battle captain's training and EIB tasks and all sorts of wonderful things that soldiers need to know. Um, the other pilot that we've done is with PEO STRI. And with PEO STRI, we focused on TCCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Does anybody not know what that is? Everybody in the room knows what TC3 is. Awesome. Some people are looking at me, they're shaking their heads. OK, that was, hard. That was tough. Raise your hand if you don't know something. Um, so TCCC. <laughs> TCCC is like first aid for com combatants. When you sign up for the Army, they put you through 12 hours of intensive training, right? And then you get deployed nine months later, and something goes boom. Do you think you remember how to use a tourniquet nine months later after you saw it there? Probably not, right? 90% of the deaths occur before a medic shows up or before you're evac to a hospital. So it's up to you to save the life of yourself and the person next to you, right? And 25% of the deaths in the last three years would have been prevented had someone remembered how to fight the number one cause of death on the battlefield, which is hemorrhagic shock. So P.O. Stry has been working with Serigo to basically change the game, and I'll show you how we did that in a second. Our initial findings for both of these studies have been a 40% reduction in training time and a 3 to 5x improvement in performance uh, for those soldiers. So zooming in on TC3, what we did was we started literally with PowerPoints. There's 350 PowerPoint slides in 13 decks. We do some knowledge extraction, which means we have to kind of separate the, get the goodies out of the PowerPoint and get them into a format that can be used by Serigo. So these are modules of content within Serigo. And I, I liken this to sort of the, uh, the personalized learning Lego. The beauty of Lego is all the bricks always fit together, right? You can make anything you want with Lego. You can make a battleship or a Christmas tree or anything you need. 
The reason is because they're designed in such a way to be exchangeable. That's the way we design content in Serigo. So when you make content in Serigo, it's not dead on arrival. This stuff can be remixed and reused by anyone as long as they have authorization. So once that content's there, the algorithm basically decides how to personalize that content and deploy it out. And it knows whether or not you need to be asked about you know, moving care, uh, casualties and care under fire or how to put in a nasal pharyngeal airway or whatever the task might be. So we basically did that with TC3, and now the whole system is on Serigo, and it's being you know, uh, tested out at some forts around the country. We are very committed to the research side of this. So we do ongoing efficacy studies and research. We work with SRI, who's in the room. Uh, we work with New York University. We have some published papers with uh, University of Toronto. The last published paper that we had on Serigo, which was really interesting, I'll tell you about, it was called Project Hope. And Project Hope was um, university's BAU, which I think is here in NYU, going into Turkey to work with Syrian refugees. And they took 150 Syrian refugee children. They ran them through a variety of things, one of which was learning Turkish on Serigo, and they saw a very big jump, about a 31% improvement against the control group. They also relieved the feeling of hopelessness by 55%, which was significant. That's a peer-reviewed study that you can look up that talks about our work. Okay. So I talked to you a little bit about the how. How do you basically apply this to the what? What we learn is really important. And the challenge with these sort of systems is always getting stuff into the system. That's always the trick, right? Somebody's got a great mousetrap, but how do you get that content in? So the way we do that is um, a couple fold. I'll show you one idea. Let's say you're a professor of astronomy. You've got stuff. You've got an astronomy textbook. You've got additional materials. You've got some great videos. You need to basically get that into a format that computers understand. You have to go from unstructured data to structured data. And that is the work of human beings. And that's what we've been doing for quite a while. But what we have introduced of recent is something called Smart Create. Smart Create leverages natural language processing and knowledge extraction to automate part of that process. And the objective is not to replace the human. Um, the objective is to form that partnership. But to have the person go from being somebody who's a, a data entry monkey to a curator of knowledge. And I think we would all agree we'd rather be the curator than the data monkey. So how do you do that? So what we've done is we have trained a natural language processing system by ingesting 5.5 million articles from the Wikipedia. So with AI, here's the thing. People love telling you how smart their AI is and talking about the algorithms they've developed. The main thing with AI is really the training. Um, how you train your algorithm is super key. So we tra trained our generalized model by ingesting all of Wikipedia. Um, we then create this knowledge graph. And the knowledge graph figures out the distance between core concepts. And when people access this knowledge graph, we can update the model based on what they tell us about the accuracy of those predictions. And then finally, the content gets rolled out. And we've got you know, 500 institutions around the world that are taking advantage of this for everything from astronomy to medicine. So that DARPA algorithm that I described helps us personalize learning. Smart Create helps us personalize content creation from any source. And I think collectively what that does is that fills knowledge gaps. So I want to talk to you about results. I'll give you some practical examples. Um, one of the first groups that we started doing research with was New York University. And their challenge was in the dental education group. So they approached us. They said, hey, we have 350 students. We take the National Dental Board exam. We want to see if Serigo can improve performance for a semester. So these two instructors created all of those objects within Serigo. They rolled it out. And they got a 100% improvement. Um, they, excuse me. They got a 100% pass rate. Every one of those 350 people passed. So the question is, where were they before? NYU is a great school. They were about at an 80% historical average. So 100 is still a good jump from that. They cut 50% of the faculty time. This got them really excited, right? Because what they're able to say is, hey, all, that, all the stuff that we don't need to do hand to hand, we can do through the system. So here's your stuff. Off you go. Come back when you're ready to have a discussion at a much higher level. Um, they also scored 2.6 standard deviations above 71 other North American dental schools, which is a nod to our friend Benjamin Bloom, who I'm sure would be very happy. This uh, was repeated the following year, and nothing perfect lasts forever. The averages fell precipitously to 99.75. So if any of you can do the math, that means one student did not pass 
out of 400. So in two years, can you imagine being the one student that didn't pass the National Dental Board <laughs> exams at NYU? Um, I was debriefing uh, General Lundy once, and uh, General Lundy quipped that that kid probably had a flip phone. So Sarago does not work on flip phones, but it works on everything else. The faculty that we worked with won the Innovative Teaching Award of the year uh, for her work with Sarago. Um, lastly, I want to talk about quantifying knowledge and capability. So let's say that Kira and I are Elliot's, I'm going to pick on Elliot again, Kira and I are Elliot's students. And Elliot gives us an exam, he wouldn't do this, so this is a bad example, but it's kind of fun. He gives us an exam, we get a 95. So we look identical. And Elliot can't really tell us apart. And that's kind of the gold standards of measurements. But what that 95 doesn't do is tell us anything about really what we know, right? Because it turns out that Kira parties a lot. And she partied the entire semester before that exam, right? And she crammed the night before, and she got that 95. And if Elliot knew that, he could predict in two weeks she's not going to be a good bet with that material. But I was the very serious, geeky guy. I studied the entire semester. I put in hours and hours before that exam. And if Elliot knew that information, he would be able to determine that I'd be a good bet with that information in the future. But it goes deeper than that, because when people use a system like Sarago, we can grab a bunch of overt and covert data. And we can use that data to get at things like um, some cognitive attributes of the user. So it turns out that Kira using Sarago has super high agility. She's fast to learn, slow to forget. She beats the algorithm every time. Whereas Andrew on the system is, is a very diligent learner. When I have problems, like I'm not just zapping through them if I get things wrong, or I ask questions of the system, I'm digging in, I'm spending more time, I'm more conscientious. And so I'm a more diligent learner. Now imagine you're a commander in the field, and you know that these two people have the same amount of training, but you know that you have a job that's going to require somebody to get hot with information in about 24 hours. You're going to go for the agile learner, because the data shows that she's going to pick it up fast. If you need somebody to run through a brick wall, I'm probably your guy, although I wouldn't actually be that guy. But in this example, I would be because I'm a super diligent person. And so we want to surface that kind of information. So our system reveals what we call knowledge, diligence, which is sort of grit, resilience, and agility, fast to learn, slow to forget. And we just announced this, um, these new uh, analytic tools that we call insights that give things about time of day effect, when your learners are actually uh, the best at learning, what days of the week, what hours of the day, and then who are your most agile, diligent, and knowledgeable performers. And I announced this. Um, two months ago on stage in DC at uh, AWS Amazon's Public Sector Forum speaking about machine learning and AI. And my passion um, is around the voice of exciting possibilities. And the flavor of the, the last couple of months is, is Amazon Alexa. And so I'm very passionate about extending capability to devices like Alexa. Why do I have to go online to learn? Why do I have to open my phone? Why is Alexa a glorified kitchen timer, right? Why can't Alexa teach me? Why can't I get information from Alexa? And so we announced uh, Insights and um, Alexa, and we announced our partnership with ASU. So ASU is our launch partner for our work with Alexa. So here, here, let me give you the background of this. We know from our data that instructors across the gamut, whether they're in the Army or they're in a nursing school, the instructors that are most engaged with their learners, those learners get the best outcomes. And we measure engagement in simple ways. Do the instructors look at the reports that we provide? And if so, how do those learners do? And what we've seen is a straight correlation between instructors who are involved and learner outcome. And ASU says the same thing. And any good institution knows this. The more involved an instructor is, the easier it gets. My belief and the hypothesis that we want to test out is if we can lower the friction for an instructor to get access to information, they'll have better performing students. And so what our first application um, that we're releasing this fall on Alexa is for an instructor, not for the learner. And the idea is, how do we make the life of the instructor easier? How do we surface and reveal data to them? So I'm going to try something a little crazy, um, a live demo of Alexa. Yesterday, it just didn't work. We were at the Defense Acquisition University, and Alexa didn't want to come out and play. So we'll see if she's in a good mood today, um, and we'll give it a whirl. Ha has anybody seen this, Alexa? The Alexa show, it's got a screen. 
You all want to crowd around this thing so we can see it? Um, it's, it's a little re less relevant what's on screen, but um, let's see if this will work. Is this mic hot? Hello? Maybe we can make this the Alexa mic. Let me turn this up. Alexa, hi. Hi there. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Alexa, start Sarah Go. Okay, Andrew. I've successfully connected to your Sarah Go account. How's my astronomy class doing? Your AST 111 has 90 students on track and 10 who are falling behind. Would you like me to nudge those 10? That's a good idea. Okay, I've sent push notifications to those students who are off track. When do my students study? Your students are most active on Friday mornings, between 9 a.m. and noon. When should my students study? Individual times vary, but overall your students are more efficient in the evening between 9 p.m. and midnight. Is there anything I should cover in class tomorrow? Some students are struggling with the concept of galaxy clusters and superclusters. You may want to cover these items in person. Can you remind me about superclusters? From your content, a supercluster is a large group of smaller galaxy clusters or galaxy groups. It is among the largest known structures of the cosmos. Get it? Okay, so that's the instructor app. And what that'll do is just basically let you say, how's my class doing? Get some feedback, ask questions about individuals. These are all APIs that are available through our web applications. We've just extended them to our friends at Amazon to create a new type of experience. The other experience would be getting at some of those qualitative, quantitative metrics that I mentioned. So let's switch scenarios. Let's say you're in a corporation. You're my company, Cerago, and you want to ask questions about your staff. Um, let's see if this will work. Alexa, I need three experts in learning science. Hmm, I don't know that one. Uh-oh. Alexa, start Sarah Go. Okay, Andrew, I've successfully connected to your Sarah Go account. Alexa, I need three experts in learning science. Take a look at Andrew, Ian, and Kyle. They have the deepest knowledge of learning science within your organization. I need three detail-oriented people for a task. Julia, Jake, and Ellison have the highest diligence across your team. What's the difference between knowledge and diligence? Knowledge refers to the depth and retention of a particular subject area, while diligence is more about how thoughtfully and consistently users learn. And one day we will have an application for the learner as well. Andrew, it will be sooner than you think. It's a little scary. OK. Um, so I want to leave you with a quote from one of my mentors. and a personal friend and advisor and a backer of Sergo, Joey Ito, the head of the MIT Media Lab. And Joey said that education is what people do to you, learning is what you do for yourself. And I think there's an application here. I believe that by blending AI with brain science, we can move from a model of education to learning. I believe that we can truly personalize learning and help anyone achieve their goals or their mission. So thank you very much. Is it time for a question or two? Yeah. Uh, are there any questions? Doctor. Um, I was a little intrigued by what you were talking about using Wikipedia. And I was just wondering, is that the source that you're using for knowledge since it's unvetted? I was just. Everything on the internet, ma'am, is true. And everything in Wikipedia. <laughs> is 100% true. No, it's the training model. So what that means is we kind of taught Alexa, to, uh, Alexa actually uses Wikipedia through us as well. We taught the system to have a generalized model of understanding 
so that we can, we can upload general information. If you were doing something in medicine, if you were studying about lymphoma, you would not want that data set. But what we would do is you'd give us a thousand articles on lymphoma. We would then build a separate knowledge space based on that content. And so then when we started uploading and asking questions about lymphoma, the system would be an expert there. So the Wikipedia is just to sort of train it to understand concepts, but not for you know, something in tank repair or in cancer research, if that makes sense. And if you find me later, I'll show you the demo on my phone and it'll, it'll click. Andrew, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the work you did with PEO Stry or potentially you know, others, have you done anything that has a, really a, a heavy hands-on application? For example, flight training, learning how to fly a helicopter or basic rifle mark, marksmanship or uh, the TCCC, yep. the actual hands-on practical yep. portion. Uh, so you can transition to live virtual construction, yep. uh, constructive through virtual reality. Or yep. Yep. So the short answer to that is, you see the, the movie The Matrix, where he's like, I need to learn how to fly this helicopter, and they upload it all. That's not what this is, right? So not yet. 2050 will be there before that. But um, the idea is that before you get hands on, so the most expensive time is blade time. Right? And the second most expensive time is sim time. Right? So how do you optimize that in terms of getting people into flight? Um, imagine before you get the sim time, you've gone through a Sarago module on that aircraft. You understand all the instrumentation. You understand everything about the takeoff, emergent procedures. You have that core knowledge. Now, can you apply it? Well, let's get you into the sim and see. And then if that sim is instrumented to feed that data back so that we can see, hey, this person is having trouble with landings. I'm making this up. That would be bad. Then the system, the Serago system, can get that data and instrument that. So we use Serago to prime people before that. Right now, we have three groups today learning the mind hounds. Most of you know what a mind hound is. It's a mind detection thing. And so instead of going through the training support PDF package, I'm trying not to smile when I say that, um, they're using Serago instead. And so they're getting all that foundational upload from the Serago system, and then they're jumping right out in the field with a mind hound. And we're seeing what's the transference of training in terms of learning on the system and being able to perform. <clears throat> so it's a super important research question, and we're all over that. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a mic turn on switch here? Yes. You go ahead, John. Okay. So the question I had is the last talk and your talk both uh, highlighted the importance of the teacher instructor. And so in our education system as well, uh, very important, but not necessarily greatest pay. But what are, what are your thoughts in terms of how do you then enable the best teacher, basically to teach a million students worldwide with the technologies and stuff you have and make them a millionaire? So why is that not possible and what would you think about that type of an approach? I, I think it is possible. I think the problem is but I think that the MOOCs started out with great intentions. Um, and the first generation of MOOCs were kind of dragging the carcass of analog to digital. It's like, oh, let's just videotape this stuff and put it up and put discussion forums and let people loose, right? But it wasn't leveraging what we know about cognitive science. It wasn't truly leveraging the technology but beyond the distribution. And it wasn't really taking advantage of best practices from great instructors. So I think that, that that partnership between the great instructor and the system can lead to millionaires. I spent 24 years in Japan um, building all sorts of wonderful things. And one of the things I was amazed about in the Japanese education system, they have jukus, these cram schools. And the instructors in these cram schools are rock stars, and they're paid rock star wages. So a top instructor can make millions of dollars a year doing instruction. They broadcast. They were using satellites before anybody was using satellites. So these guys were running time on satellites in the late 80s broadcasting instructors. So they got that if you can identify, separate the signal from the noise in terms of great instructors and use a bit of good technology, you can go far. The U.S. will catch up one day, but uh, it's definitely a possibility. So, this is, um, thank you for that. That was fascinating. Um, and a small question I have is what you think about when the use of tools like Alexa or any kind of audio search will become kind of industry standard. But my bigger question is, um, so I, I spend a lot of time trying to help people think creatively and systemically about the future or potential futures, which means helping them unlearn and sort of unharden. So all the good stuff that happens in this sort of automated, you know, in this personalized and modularized process to kind of harden and script people um, becomes a model of the world and, and like that. 
I, I have techniques for helping people unlearn, but none of them are scalable. So I'm actually, and, and by unlearn, I mean, you know, do go through the process that you taught them and then that, or that, you know, an instructor taught them using Serago. But do you have thoughts about what are next steps in more kind of complex learning, which is be beyond a, a skill, which is a set of kind of tacit understandings or ways of seeing the world and ways in which technology could help scale or support that? Was that your little question or the big? That was the big was question. The, oh, that was the big question. The little question confused. was like, should we all be investing? Oh, in, buy an Alexa, Sarah, yes. Buy an Alexa. Actually, I have, I have a couple hundred to give away from Amazon. So if anybody seriously wants to be involved in a test with me, um, I'll, I'll set you up. So come find me. The second question is best answered over drinks. Um, <laughs> I have been a keynote speaker at South by Southwest on the topic of, is Google making us stupider? I debated this in Dubai last year. You're sort of leaning into that concept of, hey, this sort of this learning when, what happens when you really need to apply this, the next level, we all want the four C's, how do we get there? I think that it's a continuum and we can't take for granted, especially given the level of education that we've all achieved, that we are constantly relying on things in our memory, on foundational knowledge and you can't get around that. And my thing is if we can shorten the time to get that done and then get people into your hands faster, that's a much better scenario, right? But we can't get around, you know, it's like we were talking about the value of memorization, and memorization is sort of a, a dirty word. I, th I think of it as memory, right? If you lose your money, it sucks, right? If you lose a limb, God forbid it's bad, but you can keep going. If you lose your memory, all right, it's kind of game over. And so we can't, we can't forget the importance of memory. I think I just made that up. I like that. You can't forget the importance of memory. But it's not everything, and we have to build from there. You don't want to go to your doctor in for a heart operation, and the guy has the Xbox for his team, and then he's got Google out, and he's like, don't worry, I got this. Let me just let me get onto Google and figure this out, right? So people need to know stuff. The question is, how many years do we have to spend teaching them? Why is medical school four years long? And if we can get them into more creative, communicative, advanced interactions faster, it's great. And the whole thing is related. And when they get there, if you have data about them, you're going to be better off. We'll have a drink. Okay. A, uh, a quick question about the, the downside. The downside. Right. Now that you've collected all this, I know that this person is more likely to be chief staff of the Army because I've watched them learn. You know, I'm into Sergo's database and I can track through it. What, uh, what sort of negative or safeguards, what, what do you think about as a threat by well, your adversary? Well, Sergo takes over the world. Yeah, I, no, so. I got that. But I mean, our adversary is tacking, tacking it seriously. Because yeah, no, it's, it's I'm going to go after the more agile person first. It's a, it's a it's a really important question. I mean, we are we are very we are a small shop, um, but we are very very careful to work with our partners in government on secure environments and keeping this information as as safe as possible. With a lot of the soldiers that we work with, we have no personally identifiable information. So we have we have numbers, and there's somebody else has the key that figures out that you're one two three four. We don't want that data. Um, that's too big a responsibility. So we take we take privacy and protection super seriously. Um, and uh, it's important. Um, we want to help the right people make the right decisions. And the last question? Sir. So we have a uh, pretty active uh, chat follow-up amongst the people that are doing the live stream, and, and they've been engaging kind of some of the jurors that talked about and asked some questions, and one of them is that they have it. One of them that I'd, that I'd like to highlight is um, this user characterized um, something, he, said, he called it the lack of instrumentation of our learners within U.S. Army education and learning centers and more broadly within the U.S. government. And so his question is, how might you approach um, sort of collecting these metrics, these measurements to start generating a training set that we can use to sort of better understand ourselves? Where do you start? Full disclosure, I got my mom in that chat room. That was her question. Um, thank you. Um, I think it starts, look, we, we want improvement. We want outcomes. You can't improve something you can't first measure. So the whole first thing is about measurement. It's about having systems that are kicking off data, data that can feed into models like models that we've built and that other good folk have built that are able to help instrument and figure things out. So the first thing is, is, is really being able to have the data and having you know, systems 
and languages that connect that data. I know there's some people in the room that are very passionate about, well, how do you link up the data between a system like Serigo and a, and a flight control system and a mannequin? Um, and there are languages um, from XML to things like LTI that are looking to marry those things together. Um, and it requires more, more energy and more standardization. It requires people to stop reinventing the wheel every time they go out and to start sharing and collaborating. And that's the only way to, uh, to bridge those gaps. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. The mic jumped on me right there, excuse me. Andrew, great, great presentation. And um, let's walk over here because I think we're doing a battle drill that we didn't have Serego to train us on, so we'll see how it goes. So if, we, if you'll come over here, Andrew, we'll let you police up your stuff. We want to make sure you get your proclamation. Oh, awesome. As a mad scientist. Wow. Thank you. So there I'm you go. I'm honored. Thank you. Our miniature of learning in 2050, our visual. That's and awesome. that is the visual we used, the one with the, uh, the human hand right, and the right. robot that we used at our Georgia Tech conference a little Thanks. couple years ago on AI, robotics, and autonomy. Uh, we love that image. Here's and here's the coin. Thank you, sir. That's awesome. Thank you so there much. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.